Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, for that very nice introduction. Um, so I really want to thank uh, Chris Ponzio and Rebecca Gerard and all the research assistants for putting together, as was said, really a beautiful, I told them this is probably the most beautiful conference room I've ever uh, spoken in, because I'm usually at academic conferences where it's very, you know, there's no money and no one sets anything up or has the aesthetic sense that Rebecca does. So, um, but really beautiful, and particularly the, the photos of kids um, is remarkable. I'm going to steal that idea at the next conference we do. Um, and so thank you. I'm going to proceed because um, uh, the time is a little bit compressed, and I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. Um, so, uh, so my disclosures, uh, I work for Maine Medical Healthcare, I've consulted for uh, a bunch of places, and um, have research funding from NIMH and several foundations, and then I also uh, started a summer camp in Maine, a sleepaway camp for kids with high-functioning autism, and I think you have a flyer in your bags regarding that camp. Um, and you can like it on Facebook as well. Um, <laughs> look at our website. Uh, I'm happy to talk to anyone about that. Um, so today, uh, I want to try to set the stage a little bit for the topic of the day, which is co-occurring conditions in autism, or what else shall we look at in individuals who are presenting with challenging behaviors, typically, uh, with autism. Um, and so the focus of the later speakers will be really in on psychiatric comorbidity, which is a very important and, and a challenging and complex topic. And I'm going to give a little broader look at that, uh, or a broader look at the kind of landscape. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I'm going to look at, so today we're going to look at um, features and challenges in autism. Um, sources of challenging behavior, so what's the etiology of that challenging behavior. Uh, multi and then what I'm going to do, try to do, is um, tell you about some different things that we've done to try to address those things. Um, and the purpose of that is not to turn you into people who are doing inpatient treatment or doing one of these kind of programs, but rather use these to kind of exemplify the principles that, that we try to operate on. So I'm going to give you a couple different ways to look at that. I may have to skip you know, one part just for time. Uh, so we're going to look at uh, the inpatient program that I run, and then some information from the six-site inpatient study that we're running. Um, we're going to also look at um, an inpatient treatment pathway that we developed with Bellevue Hospital uh, in the city. Um, and uh, so I can pretend I'm a New Yorker and say in the city, uh, and um, meaning you know, this one. Um, and then uh, consensus recommendations that we develop for treatment, if we have time. So, um, just very briefly, autism um, in DSM-5, two core domains, social communication and interaction challenges, and then restricted repetitive patterns of behaviors and interests, or RRBIs, as we say. Um, and I won't go through this for for time, but on the left you can see the criteria for one domain, and on the right two out of four um, criteria. And just notable that in DSM-5, finally having uh, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input, you finally made it into the DSM um, as a possible criterion. What you don't see here is um, psychic, any, anything about depression, anxiety, etc. So as it's conceptualized currently in the DSM, that's not part of the core criteria. Also importantly, what you do not see here are challenging behaviors. You don't see aggression, self-injury, emotional dysregulation, property destruction, etc. And I think that's just worth noting. It's obvious, but I think it's worth noting because that means then, and I think accurately so, that that is not part of autism. Right? So when those things are happening, we have, to, we have to look at why. And of course, hopefully we are because of the risks and the challenges. But sometimes, I make that point because sometimes when we're having conversations with insurance reviewers or funders, and they say, well, a person's doing this and you know, they have autism, you say, well, I, I didn't see aggression in the diagnostic criteria for autism, so this is a problem. This is not because they have autism. Um, 
So, uh, as you all know, autism is a highly heterogeneous group uh, of individuals, um, a broad spectrum. We're focusing more today, I think, on, at least in my talk, uh, I'm focusing more on those who um, have more severe presentations. Um, uh, one of the challenges, or, or one way to think about autism, is that what we call autism is a clinical entity, right? And so, and, and the reason then for the variety of what we call autism, which is a very wide variety, right? From not from an individual who might be completely nonverbal to an individual who's hyperverbal. Like, how is that the same thing? Well, so we're using the spectrum concept currently, but the I think one way to think about it is that what we call autism represents, you know, it's a final common presentation of multiple pathways and factors. Um, and I think the evidence overall points toward early neurodevelopmental changes in white matter tract and other areas of the brain and, and body. Uh, that I think, you know, I think most of the evidence points toward fetal, fetal life. Um, briefly, prevalence, one in 68 in 2014 by the CDC methodology. We could do a whole talk about that methodology, but um, that's what it is uh, and how they do it. Still true, has been true for a long time, as far as we know, four to one, males to females. Um, some, you know, affects all racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups, um, and symptoms often become apparent when the demands exceed capacity, particularly for those who would be considered higher functioning. So what are the problems that we see in autism? Um, what are the behavioral or challenging behaviors that we see in autism? So um, this was, I like to reference this study because it's hard to get, most studies are of clinical populations and this study was of a community population. So what they did is they surveyed, they identified kids with autism from their IEP, from community schools. So this is like basically a non-clinically referred population. It's just kids in schools have autism, and then surveyed the parents and said, what are the primary problems that you um, see or experience with your child? And so these were the answers. Um, so the most common was easy frustration, inattention, hyperactivity, followed by more challenging things, temper tantrums, irritability, fearfulness, anxiety, uh, as reported by parents. And then at the bottom, thankfully, in a significant but relatively lower percentage of folks, we had serious challenging behaviors, harming self, destroying property, physical aggression. Um, so I think that's important. I try to remind myself of this because this is pretty much my whole world here at the bottom, um, as well as these other things. Um, but thankfully, at least in this survey, it's a minority of folks who are experiencing this uh, in their youth. Um, and so I said, this is my world, that bottom piece. So um, this is not why kids are psychiatrically hospitalized for autism. Uh, not that, that whole list. They don't get hospitalized because of frustration or inattention, typically. This is a survey we did of hospital units. And the reason they're getting hospitalized, not surprisingly, is because of more severe, challenging behaviors. So this was a, the question was, what was the chief complaint, kind of the main reason that they were hospitalized? And this was the answer. Aggression, self-injury, property destruction, then kind of a smattering of tantrums, elopement, decreased functioning, meaning not functioning, um, and sexualized behavior. And of course, many individuals present with multiple of these, but the question was, what was the most challenging thing? Um, so the question when there's a behavior, right, is when is a problem a problem? because there's a lot of things that one could say is a problem. There's also things you can say are a strength, of course. Um, and so I think uh, one way to think about it is in deciding, is this a problem? And then, because there's, right, there's limited resources, there's only so much one can do. So you have to pick and choose what you're gonna address, right, as treaters and parents and as a community. Um, and so some of the questions I think that are relevant are, is this behavior interfering with learning? Is it interfering with socialization? Um, is it interfering with participating in the community? And then, of course, the safety questions. Is it causing injury to the individual or other people, damaging the environment, um, which may or may not be worth taking on? Um, how is it affecting family functioning? And uh, finally, is it failing to respond to traditional techniques um, that are already available 
and that, then that's likely a problem. And the one I want to point out particularly is the one that's easy to gloss over, which is, is it interfering with learning? I think in some ways the thing that I worry about the most and the biggest problem is I think about kids as um, you know, on a developmental trajectory. And there's a lot of things that can influence that trajectory. And certainly we all have the view that that trajectory could be, you know, we want that slope to be as, as high as possible. Um, and if a person is in a really good, let's say, preschool program uh, for autism, getting good training, maybe an early start Denver model or something else, a good evidence-based program, but they start to, you know, they start biting other kids, et cetera, and they get booted out of that program, right? Or they can only attend half the time or whatever. What does that do to their developmental trajectory? I mean, that one thing could bend that trajectory downward, I would propose, in a way that outcomes could be very different, um, you know, five, ten years out. So it's a big deal, in my view, um, these behaviors, you know. It's not just something we kind of deal with because it has big effects on that trajectory. And of course it has effects in all these other areas. Um, so how do we deal with these behaviors? Um, or how do we approach them? So here are some of the, the major approaches. There are others, but um, some of the major things I think we think about are um, applied behavioral analysis, treating psychiatric comorbidity, diagnosing and then treating, communication interventions, um, social skills or social cognitive strategies for higher functioning folks typically, sensory regulation strategies, emotion regulation strategies, psychotherapy approaches, um, medical, treating medical problems as they arise, um, and then of course family work and parent management training. There are other modalities or approaches, but these are some of the major ones, particularly ones that have some evidence behind them. So I think a point worth making is um, one of the big presentations, right, is aggression. I mean, that's clearly a problem. If someone is attacking, hitting, kicking, biting, whatever, other people, or you know, including other kids, that's gonna lead you, that's gonna start shrinking the individual's world very fast, right, and bending that developmental trajectory Possibly, um, so I think that's. I think we would probably all agree that's a problem, um, and so it probably rises to the top. But I don't really want to treat aggression. I will do it if I have to. I'll explain that in a second. But what I what what I really want to do, and I, and I shouldn't personalize to me. I think what we want to do as treaters is treat upstream. So in other words, what's causing the aggression, um, and so. There are many, you know, multiple domains that we can look at that could be contributing or leading to this aggression. Often there are multiple pieces, which is why we often need a multidisciplinary approach, which is very hard to do in our healthcare system, which is organized and paid in discipline-specific ways. However, I think good programs find a way to cross disciplines. Um, so in no particular order, not, you know, this isn't first because I'm, a child psychiatrist as well as a pediatrician, but anyway, no particular order. Psychiatric comorbidity is certainly one thing that can contribute. Of course, behavioral function and reinforcement of behaviors can contribute, and often does. Um, functional communication impairments, side effects of medications and other things, because everything we do has potential side effects, including behavioral analysis has side effects. Um, but it's easiest to think of side effects in terms of meds. Um, dysregulation in the sensory system, mismatch in demands versus abilities in either direction, um, family changes. I've seen multiple kids who end up in the hospital because of family changes, a death, the birth of a sibling, right? And it's going to be just as, as dysregulating and challenging for the kid with autism as for the neurotypical kid, but it's often not kind of thought about. Um, medical illness or pain, genetic linkage uh, sometimes, or you know, more rarely, and then challenges with emotion regulation. So um, let's talk about, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about each of these areas, you're gonna hear far more from other speakers, but for psychiatric comorbidity, basically the takeaway is, is that it's quite common, both for individuals with intellectual disability, as well as for individuals with autism, or autism plus minus intellectual disability. Um, so, you're going to hear more about this later, um, so I'll just say it's quite prevalent. And most studies, I think at this point, this is a challenging area, as you're going to hear, um, but most studies are kind of coalescing around um, 
50 to 70 percent of individuals with autism can be diagnosed with a co-occurring psychiatric uh, disorder or comorbidity. Um, this is one study I'll just highlight, which is I thought was a very good study, which was um, a group of, of real autism experts um, at Boston University, I believe it was, um, took a standard psychiatric diagnostic instrument, the KSADS, which is very well validated and used, and they altered it to basically make it speak autism. So they tried to filter out what's typical for autism. Um, and there's a lot more one can say about that, but they did that and then they ran about 100 kids through it, um, and this is what they came out with. Uh, and what they came out with was, um, I think, something that the field is coalescing around, which is anxiety, most prevalent, um, and here's the distribution they got, um, followed by ADHD, about 30% in this, in this instrument, followed by mood, depressive disorders, uh, and then more rare uh, things. So I'm not saying this is the final word by any means, but I thought this was a good, a good look at this. And so the good news here, right, is this is actually the same as the neurotypical population of kids. What's most prevalent psychiatric problem or, or mental health challenge in neurotypical kids? Anxiety. Second, ADHD. Most people think that's the flip, but it's not. Anxiety is the most common issue uh, for many of us. Um, uh, and followed by ADHD, and then followed by mood disorders and then psychosis and more, more less common uh, issues. And so the other good news here, right, at least in the neurotypical population and hopefully increasingly in the autism population is the anxiety and ADHD are actually our most treatable and we have the best evidence for. We are, uh, the meds are not that great for mood disorders overall, although, you know, uh, anyway. Um, but we have the best evidence for treatment for anxiety and ADHD, so that's also potentially good. All right, um, so assessing challenging behaviors, um, which is a whole talk, of course, in and of itself, but how do we make sense of challenging behaviors? So the big, a big question, obviously, to ask is what is the function of the behavior? And that's the entire field of, uh, that's, that's undergirds the field of applied behavioral analysis. Um, and really it's what is the individual getting out of engaging in the behavior? Um, there are, I think, you, there's a bunch of ways to look at this, but one is that there are basically four primary functions of challenging behavior, either to gain it to social attention, access to preferred items or activities, um, escaping or avoiding non-preferred things, and then the nefarious category of automatic reinforcement or self-stimulatory, which sometimes it's clear that that's the function, sometimes that category is used for if it's like we don't know what the function is. Um, so another area that I've been involved in looking at and I think is an emerging area is the challenges that we think are part, that are part of autism in many of its forms, which is challenges in emotion regulation. Um, so challenges with cognitive control, inhibitory control, processing emotions, um, uh, and there's many things that contribute to this. Um, including physiologic arousal and other things, <clears throat> but one way to capture all of it is emotion dysregulation uh, or emotion challenges with emotion regulation. And so I think that's something to think about. Any individual with autism who you're working with, you can kind of assume that there may be some challenge with emotion regulation, so that can then inform how you're interacting with them and the interventions you might look at in terms of um, helping them cope with, with uh, the environment. Common medical problems in autism, uh, also an important area as, as one of the speakers in the video was talking about. Um, so just a very brief look at this. Uh, seizures are um, an issue in autism. However, um, as autism diagnosis has changed and the spectrum has widened, it used to be said that 20, 25% of individuals with autism develop seizures. That's no longer the case. It's more like 10% because it's far more, it's more prevalent in um, however you want to term it, the more severely affected or the lower functioning end of the spectrum. Um, so as the spectrum is widened, um, it's become you know, less prevalent. Uh, there are two peaks for the seizures. There's kind of this early onset when they're very young, um, but then there's this surprise emergence for some individuals when they're kind of peri-adolescent, 11, 13, 14, a kid who's never had a seizure in their life, 
suddenly you know, starts having seizures. So that, that's an interesting element. Um, GI problems by far are the most common medical issue, uh, which I probably don't need to tell anyone in the room here who works with uh, individuals with autism. Um, and the GI problems are the basic ones, the most common ones, constipation and GERD, um, which luckily we can treat um, to some degree. Um, there's you know, debate and exploration in the field about why they have those problems. You know, is it just the same constipation as other individuals with developmental delay have, or is there something more sophisticated going on, and that's very unclear in my opinion. Allergies, and then things that other kids get, minor injuries, ear infections, headaches, dental problems. These are all the kind of most common medical issues. Um, so now I'm going to, so that was kind of a look at autism and some of the features and, and challenges. Um, and so now I'm going to tell you about our treatment program in Maine, our, actually one aspect of our treatment program, which is our inpatient program, which is a, a specialized hospital unit um, that is within a psychiatric hospital that has eight units. So this is one of those units that only admits individuals with autism or intellectual disability. They're coming because of aggression, self-injury, property destruction, et cetera. Um, they're often coming from residential treatment centers where, you know, even though good work is being done, they're, they're just um, not manageable or not, not doing well. Um, so the philosophy of this program is that we can engage the child, the family, the community to stabilize what's going on and address both the acute crisis, but also if there are key sources of chronic crisis, and I'll say more about that. The other basic tenets are that we're ABA-based, and so positive behavioral reinforcement helps kids take the risk to give up behaviors that are working for them and learn new behaviors, because as maladaptive as it may appear to us that people are engaging in aggression, self-injury, et cetera, it's only happening because it's working at some level. Um, and so I think that's, a, I stole this from our psychologist, uh, one of our psychologists. I think it's a very empathic way to look at challenging behaviors is it's working for them and it's really a risk for them to try something new. Um, <clears throat> so I think that gives you a lot of sympathy, empathy for what's going on. And then of course, diagnosis of psychiatric comorbidity, um, if you're rigorous about it, I think improves outcomes. <clears throat> so if you're gonna, take that philosophy seriously, then you have to look at, well, why are kids ending up in your care? Um, so I'm gonna just very quickly go through this. This is an example of you know, thinking about what's the causality chain leading to admission. <clears throat> and you can do this with any program. <clears throat> so you have a kid with a developmental disorder, which means by definition, you likely have impairments in emotion regulation and communication. Um, so that can lead to all kinds of issues, right? We might not have functional communication, we might have providers who don't have training who are working with the individual. Um, those things can lead to other issues like polypharmacy, misdiagnoses, communication frustration, family stress. Um, and what that develops sometimes that we see is a state of chronic crisis where the person, the individual is agitated, there's staff moving in and out of the picture, uh, don't, you know, we don't have a set of coping skills to deal with everyday life stresses. Um, and so then this leads to what we call an acute crisis, which is a high frequency of, you know, very challenging behavior, or it's not even a high frequency, but it's just happened too much. And then we call that an acute crisis. And so my point is, is that if all we do is focus on this as an acute crisis, like they, you know, hit one too many people and so they're psychiatrically hospitalized and that's the problem, um, that usually won't lead to sustained improvement. We have to say this, actually this kid usually has been in chronic crisis, this system has been in chronic crisis, and what are the sources in there? We can't address all of them, certainly not in, in a briefer treatment program, but what are the key pieces that are driving that that maybe we could address or at least identify? So to do that, then you need a large team, I think, ideally. So this is the team we have. We have all these disciplines um, full-time on the team. Um, so as I said, the foundation of treatment is uh, ABA-based behavioral treatment. 
um, with targeted psychopharm and then transferring skills to the parents, the school, the in-home staff. Because remember, this is a hospital treatment program, right? And so what if all we do, if we're wonderfully successful and the kid greatly improves while they're in this program, and then they discharge, and that's it, um, I'm not sure what we've accomplished. Because the goal is not to make them look good in the hospital. I mean, that makes us all feel, that feels nice, and, and et cetera, and we can pat ourselves on the back, but then if, if it just deteriorates when they go home, we haven't really accomplished anything, or they go back to their residential program. So we have to try to transfer skills and have things maintained. <clears throat> so those were the core elements of treatment. Um, additional treatment paths uh, that we apply variously depending on what's presenting. Um, so for folks with higher functioning ASD, where often the issue is emotion regulation, social cognitive challenges, and what that leads to is people who have low frequency but higher intensity um, blow-ups, you know, maybe once every couple of weeks, there's a giant blow-up, I'm gonna blow up the school, or you know, there's, a, there's a, a very challenging behavior, then we have to address that and try to approach it. Um, if anxiety is the problem, then we try to use and adapt our evidence-based treatments for anxiety. Um, it, and then for other things, with, there are other specific approaches. Like if there's active PTSD that we can recognize, then we're going to try to adapt um, our best evidence-based treatment for uh, trauma in kids, which is trauma-focused CBT. Um, and depending on the individual's communication and intellectual level, that you know can be a real challenge, but we're going to try to do that. So a very important part of this, as I said, is transferring skills. So in our treatment program, which is 40 days, on um, average 30 to 40 days, um, we, from day one, say we have a family behavioral training program. And, and we want you to participate, and here are the elements of it. Because again, if we develop this wonderful behavioral plan with lots of antecedent manipulations and <coughs> embedding speech and occupational therapy supports and all you know, really doing what we think is best, but it doesn't get carried forward, then again, what have we accomplished? So that program is first didactic with the parents uh, or the caregivers, and then more importantly than the didactic piece um, is then we do in vivo work. So first we have them come in and observe what we're doing. So we call it shadowing, and we give them a badge that says, I'm shadowing, so they know what they're doing, and the staff know what they're doing. And then once we kind of feel like they're done shadowing, then they're running, which means they're running the behavioral plan, and they're running it, and the staff step back and just basically observe and coach and support and step in if you know a serious safety thing develops. So we're doing live coaching and, and practice which is really the best model for learning. You know, the best model for learning, despite what we're doing today, is not sitting and receiving didactics, of course. So, um, although it's a good way to do it with 150 people. And so, you know, the technical term is we're transferring stimulus control from the therapist, from the staff in the program, to the parents and community providers. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example, a case example of this, of, of just one case to try to exemplify how this works in this program. So six-year-old girl, this is a typical admission, although maybe a little younger than our average kid. Six-year-old girl with autism, mild intellectual disability. Um, this is the picture she came in with. So she came in because she had frequent tantrums, maybe 30 to 120 minutes total a day, so up to two hours a day but in smaller chunks. Um, and the tantrums were accompanied by aggression, hitting, biting, kicking other people, 30 to 40 incidents, let's say, a day of that. Um, uh, communication was nonverbal, meaning less than 10 single words, which is one definition of nonverbal. <clears throat> was using pecs at school, supposedly, but not at home at all, or not outside those 30 hours a week at all, um, which is not uncommon. Um, motor challenges, particularly with using utensils to eat, forks and, and spoons. Um, she was about pre-K level um, for educational abilities. Um, physiologic, she was um, very highly aroused and then she was awakening three to four times a night. So she was sleeping maybe four or five hours a night, this six-year-old. Um, and finally, uh, she was also on for medication, risperidone, four milligrams a day, which is, um, well above the, the tested doses for a child of that size, um, and she was on Benadryl, PRN, 
as trying to kind of address her, her these tantrums. So the question for our team and for you folks is, what is the diagnosis? So you've got this whole picture. You probably can see there's a bunch of different problems there. Um, she's coming in because of tantrums that, uh, that, are, that are paired with aggression. Um, so what's the diagnosis? So there's a number of things you could think about in terms of the diagnosis or the etiology. You know, in the medical world, we call it diagnosis, behavioral function. Um, but what's the etiology? What's, what's leading to this presentation of aggression in the middle? So things one can think about, I think, from that presentation are, you know, is there, she's minimally verbal or nonverbal, so always very worried about occult medical illness. Does she have a dental abscess, et cetera? So there you're looking for the um, chronology of what's happened and then, you know, trying to examine and find things, um, looking for clues. So medical illness, Communication, there, you know, she's not using PECs across um, settings. Uh, in fact, she's using it only 30 of 168 hours a week, so that's a problem, I think, um, potentially. Um, is there, you know, a comorbid thing going on? Um, is comorbid psychiatric illness going on? Rarely could this be related to a genetic syndrome. I mean, she isn't sleeping well, and she has aggression, and probably had some self-injury, so, you know, uh, very unlikely could she have something like smith mcginnis syndrome, which um, is associated with those things as well as autism. Are there family issues going on? What about treatment side effects? So she's on this big whopping dose of risperidone. She's also getting Benadryl like intermittently. What's that doing? Um, uh, it's very hard for me not to opine about that, but that's not a good idea. Um, you know, what's the behavioral function and what, what is the sensory element to this? And there's other domains you can think about. So I laid that out as a nice, you know, organized, systematic thing, and that's how you want to think through it, of course. Um, the challenge is, as it comes to you, and the reality of it is, is it's not so, so laid out so nicely, right? This is probably more like a potential picture where you've got aggression, but the contributors are these, you know, multiple, and some are contributing a little, some are contributing a lot. And so that's what makes this challenging, but I think also interesting and, and, and intellectually stimulating. So here's what we thought, taking the history from the parents and other providers and then watching her for you know, a few days is what we thought was going on initially. Um, so we, we thought that she was definitely frustrated with communication. It turns out that whatever level her PEX was stated to be, she was below that even when she was using it. So she wasn't able to functionally communicate. She wasn't able to spontaneously functionally communicate. Um, she was also really confused and disoriented. She didn't know which way she was coming or going because she had no environmental supports, no visual schedule, no you know, things that we all need. We all, likely all of you have schedules that you look at for your day. So, so do our kids need schedules. They need to know what they're doing now, what they're doing later, when will they get to eat, all of those things. <clears throat> if our schedule today didn't have lunch on it, I think there would be some dysregulation among you. You, know, you would be you would be thinking seriously to yourself. So, are, am I going to get to eat? And this would be dysregulating. Um, so, you know, similarly, I think our kids need to know that as well, and they can't pick it up necessarily from the environment. So, they need to be told. Um, uh, a major problem, likely due to the risperidone as well as the. Um, not sleeping was or sleeping well. But she was very tired, and she was tired from not sleeping, and she was sedated from the risperidone. Those are two different things. Um, another problem was she was really cute, and so she was kind of getting away with lots of stuff, um, and that wasn't helping. Even our you know kind of trained staff, like she was just so cute, um, which is you know a big strength, but was is also can be a problem. Um, there was a lot of reinforcement of the behavior by people attending to the screaming, not our staff, but in the environment. Um, and she was hungry, I, we thought, and she was struggling at mealtime, uh, and so she was hungry. So what do you do then? <clears throat> so this is what we did. Um, so the problem, again, is a tantrums plus minus aggression. So the problem is actually tantrums plus aggression, um, but sometimes they occur without it. And so these were the major areas we thought we should address. Communication, the behavioral response or behavioral plan, her sleep, structuring her environment so that she was oriented and not confused, and then actually helping her eat better. So 
you can look down this in your, um, hopefully you have handouts, but uh, uh, so we worked on her PEX use. We also worked with the family and the providers on, you know, she needs to be able to use this not just at school, but elsewhere. Um, we uh, then took her off the risperidone. We definitely took her off the Benadryl right away. Um, we worked on a behavioral plan um, where we were not reinforcing the tantrums as well as denying escape. Um, and then, as I told you, we had the parents and other providers come in and train on the plan, as well as get feedback from the parents and providers on what do we need to modify in this plan so that it will it's doable at home. Because if we send them home with a, like, you're going to give a token every 20 seconds at home, that's not going to happen. So we have to get feedback and be realistic. <clears throat> For her sleep, um, the first thing we did is with all the kids, you know, good sleep hygiene, regular bedtime routine, nothing exciting at night, no video games. That actually fixes a lot of sleep problems, in my opinion, but that's or my experience, but that's challenging to do at home. And <clears throat> she actually continued in the hospital with waking up at night consistently multiple times. So I thought she truly had a sleep disorder. Um, and um, it was not fixed by sleep hygiene, so we did end up using a sleep medication called trazodone for her. Um, but we did talk about sleep hygiene also with parents. We structured her environment in these various ways, um, and then we worked on her eating mostly with adaptive utensils so she could eat more easily. So this is her, this is her aggression graph. Um, so this is about 40 days, um, and so she came in with about you know, 20 to 70, uh, that's an outlier, but 20 to 70 aggressive acts per day. Um, and what you see is what we like to see, but often see, which is a, a nice downward slope, um, but it's not a straight line. You know, we have some ups and downs along the way, and we try not to be overly reactive to the, you know, one day really doesn't mean anything. Um, <clears throat> which is why data is really important, because as human beings, we quickly react to the latest thing that's happened. Um, but that's actually what we don't want to do. Um, so anyway, this is her graph. So settle down in this last phase. There's a lot of transfer of training and information and then discharge. Not all our graphs look like that, obviously, but a fair number do. Um, so my, my um, way to back up that statement is this is a graph from a study we did of about 40 of our kids um, looking at change over time. And <clears throat> for the sake of time, I'll be brief and just say, um, so this is a measure, I know this is a complicated figure, but basically this is a measure, uh, this is called the Aberrant Behavior Checklist on the left. Higher is worse. Um, and what it measures is aggression, self-injury, and severe tantrums. So that's a pretty good measure for our population, right? In fact, you know, it's a really good measure. And this is actually the measure that's been used for a lot of medication treatment studies in autism. Um, <clears throat> so they come in really high. This is at admission. Thankfully, uh, they leave really low. So kind of clinically interfering uh, problem behavior on this is usually considered to be like a 12 to 16. If you're, if you're in or above that threshold, then that's usually the entry criteria for a study. Um, so if you're below that, then you're not having very significant or severe problems, uh, though you're having some. Um, and so they leave below that, that, that threshold, um, which is very nice to see. However, I'll just say that um, that better be the case, right? Because they're coming into this expensive program, staying for 30 or 40 days, we're throwing all kinds of resources at them, hopefully, you know, and with really good practitioners. Um, so, you know, they better get better, um, or else we should just close our doors. Um, and uh, so thankfully they do. Um, but the thing we had no idea about, because we had never measured it um, before we did a research study on it, is how, what kind of maintenance were we seeing um, afterward? Uh, and so um, the good news is that we're basically seeing maintenance of that game at two months post-discharge, um, which I was happy to see. There's a slight regression there. It wasn't statistically significant in this analysis, but clearly it's there. Um, and so uh, we were very happy to see that because we really had no idea what happened post-discharge. And we get our stories, and of course, we see we, kids who don't do well sometimes get readmitted, um, but, you know, we didn't know. So that was very important to see. 
So that was for our site. Um, so that's what I was tell you about our individual program. Now I'm going to give you um, the other three pieces, which is first I'm going to tell you some information we've learned from looking at six specialized units around the country, and we've formed this um, research network of specialized hospital units. So I'm going to tell you some information we've learned from that that's about to be published, hopefully. Um, and then we'll look at some other aspects of this. So we have this research network, including uh, some wonderful places, including Bradley Hospital in Rhode Island, which some New York kids go to, uh, Shepherd Pratt, Kenny Krieger in Baltimore, uh, Western Psychiatric Institute, which is University of Pittsburgh, Cincinnati Children's, and Children's Hospital of Colorado. So these are all simil somewhat similar specialized inpatient treatment units for kids with autism and other developmental disabilities. Um, so the study, the main study we're running through that network is called the Autism Inpatient Collection. It's an ongoing study. I'm going to give you information from kind of some of the, the earlier cohort of 350 kids. We now have almost 900 kids enrolled in the study. Um, and so the study is doing very rigorous assessment of the kids, including very rigorous establishment that they do indeed have autism. Um, and then the goal of the study is really to produce a, a accessible database um, for any investigator in the world to access and use to run their own studies and look at their own things, including all of these folks are going to have, um, you know, have the whole exome sequencing of their genetics. And so that's really the goal of it. We, of course, have our own questions, but, but we're humble enough to know that our own Questions as investigators aren't nearly as important as having a hundred or a thousand other investigators be able to try to answer their own questions with this database. So, um, so some of the things that have emerged or so far early on from this work are, um, I'm just going to give you a smattering of this. What are the risk factors for hospitalization? So, you know, this is a, obviously we don't want kids to be hospitalized. So a couple of things that have emerged are um, risk factors for hospitalization include the level of adaptive functioning, AS, uh, autism symptom severity, the primary caregiver's marital status. So single parents, um, there's a higher risk of psychiatric hospitalization. That's an association, it's not a causation. Um, the presence of a mood disorder and sleep problems. And these were all independently raised the risk of psychiatric hospitalization. And I thought the sleep problem one was notable, right? I mean, we all know this if we work with this population, but I think that there is too little focus on sleep from most providers. So when I see, I see outpatients also, when they come in, that's one of the first things I want to address, you know, even if there's aggression, stuff, it's like, let's try to get this kid sleeping. And which also, if you do that, then the parents will love you forever <laughs> and trust you forever because now everyone's sleeping. And as they say, if mama ain't sleeping, nobody's happy. Um, so uh, anyway, um, so that's some risk factors for hospitalization. Another element that we've just started to look at is suicidality in the population, which is a whole another topic. Um, and so suffice it to say that we found a surprisingly high indicator of possible suicidality in the population. This was with um, a subgroup. We looked at folks who had IQ greater than 55 and were verbal. Um, suicidality does occur, and, and but we know very little about it in folks with lower IQ or who are less verbal, but it's, it's also an important topic. But anyway, this is what we looked at, and um, risk or correlates, clinical correlates for suicidality, we thought in, in this group included a comorbid mood disorder and or, or an anxiety disorder. Both of them raised the risk of presenting with suicidality. Uh, we looked at medication use a little bit, um, and so not surprisingly for these hospitalized kids, um, more than 90% were on one or more psychotropic medications, both at admission and discharge. There was actually, uh, I was pleased to see, a mild decline, or they were on slightly less medication on average at two-month follow-up. So that was um, interesting, and we're trying to understand that. Um, antipsychotics, stimulants, and sleep aids were the most common medications used during these hospitalizations. Um, and uh, we did not see differences in the usage of medication based on age, gender, or nonverbal IQ, which is a little bit surprising. Um, we also took a look at the relationship of problem behavior and verbal ability. 
Um, and so we split out the minimally verbal and the fluent verbal groups, uh, uh, kids into two groups. Um, and we were a little surprised to see that the severity of self-injury, stereotype behavior, and irritability did not significantly differ between uh, the minimally verbal and the fluent verbal groups. Um, what did emerge is that having lower adapting or coping scores on a certain measure was, was associated with increased severity of different problem behaviors, even when you accounted for verbal ability. So I think the thing that emerged from this is that adapting and coping uh, mechanisms and skills, so that emotion regulation piece, is really important across the verbal spectrum. And it's something that, as a field, we have not, I think good clinicians often find ways to do that, but as a field, we have not really developed that very well and haven't, you know, there's emerging evidence for those kind of approaches. So that's a whole area to be further developed. Um, in terms of behavioral outcomes, so here's the six site version of the prior graph or figure that I showed you of just my site when we did a smaller study. So this is 350 kids across six sites. Um, same thing, admission, discharge, two month follow-up. So what you see here is um, the six sites and you see that they all have the same basic pattern which kids come in pretty, pretty behaviorally disturbed, they get better by discharge, and then there's some regression by two month follow-up. Um, but obviously these lines are not the same, and in fact, it, it kind of looks like we have a group of three units who get a bigger drop and more maintenance of the gains, and then a group of three units that get less of a drop and um, less maintenance. Um, we're still trying to understand why there are these differences across these units, particularly, potentially these two groups. Um, the only, so far as we've modeled this and analyzed it, length of stay so far is the only significant um, covariate, and so meaning that we're finding that shorter length of stay is associated with um, less improvement and less durability in that improvement. Okay, so that's um, that inpatient study. Um, so now I'm going to tell you about two other things, again just trying to exemplify how we approach and think about challenging behaviors. So this was a different project. Um, this is a project we did, or I did, with Bellevue Hospital, where um, in Manhattan, where they have regular psych child psychiatric, child and adolescent psychiatric units, but they're getting a fair number of kids with autism or intellectual disability, about 10 to 20 percent of their population, and so they, we, you know, they got in touch with us and said, you know, getting a lot of these kids, you do this work, you know, as as your whole world. What can we do to improve their care? Um, so we did a couple of year project, and, the, and how we decided to do it was to develop a care pathway for those kids when they enter those units. So similar to how many hospitals now, if uh, your parent goes into the hospital with congestive heart failure, they get put on the congestive heart failure pathway, and that pathway has a bunch of standardized elements, and that's been a real quality improvement for many places in the medical field, right? And the common elements of that are you get some standardized evaluations, you use checklists, you know, do you have your compression socks, and are you taking your ACE inhibitor and other things for, for congestive heart failure, and then you track benchmarks and performance. That's, that's what a care pathway is. Um, and I would say mental health settings have been pretty slow to adopt this method of doing things, so, but we decided to try it for these um, inpatient units. So uh, what, what did we decide? So in other words, the challenge to us was how do we take everything we know that we think works and boil it way down so that a regular child psychiatric unit that has no additional resources and doesn't have specialists in autism, et cetera, could improve the care for these kids. So we had to make it like boil it way down, make it as simple as possible, make it not cost money. Um, so this is pretty challenging, right? Um, so here's what we thought were the key elements. And the reason I'm using this as an example of ways to do this in any, I think this could be applied in any treatment program. Um, so the first thing was the evaluation. We added, we thought there was key information to get at admission specific to this population that isn't collected normally. Like you don't normally ask, do they have, when a kid gets admitted to a psych unit, they don't, the, the standard question is not, uh, how do they communicate and do they have a communication device and did you bring it with you? Right? That's an important question for our population. Um, so we added some key information. We 
focused on addressing the basics, which I'll tell you about, supporting predictability and activity, a very basic positive reinforcement schema, um, some concrete coping strategies, enhancing communication, and then we did some staff training and environmental modifications. And so just to say, this was developed with my colleagues at Bellevue Hospital and NYU, um, and uh, very much um, credit them. So here's um, a quick look at the key information sheet. It was just one page, but there was this additional information. We called it the tip sheet, and uh, it was filled out with the parents taking history. So there are things on there like, how does the child communicate? What communication does the child understand? Um, what are the warning signs for this child becoming upset? You know, things that would be natural for us to think about coming into a, a program for individuals with developmental disabilities, but are not natural necessarily if you're just entering a typical mental health setting. Um, also, activities and rewards. What does the child enjoy doing? And so we created this as a tip sheet, and the idea is this follows the child through the admission. So this is available to all the staff as they're changing on shifts. So that was one piece. The second was addressing the basics, so getting people to focus on the very basics, like is this kid eating and drinking? Are they sleeping? Are they in pain? Are they toileting? These are things that when these kids end up in settings that aren't set up for them, can be kind of, you know, everyone starts focusing on the behavior, et cetera, and kind of, it, you can miss the basics. So we thought that was worth highlighting. Um, supporting predictability, so this is building in schedules and and communication strategies to keep people, keep the individual oriented. Um, we did a very basic um, positive reinforcement for non, you know, a DRO program, a non-display non of target behaviors, and um, tried to get the unit to become flexible enough to use the reinforcement that mattered to the kid, right? Because typically reinforcement systems in, in neurotypical settings are you know, privileges, like, oh, you get to go to the hospital cafe, or you get to go to the unit store and change in your points, and like, you know, some, our kid may not, could care less about any of that, but if it could get five minutes of the Barney video, life is great, and so, you know, but getting those, those environments to be flexible and deliver five minutes of a Barney video is, doesn't happen without some intentionality. Um, focusing on concrete coping strategies um, and talking about the escalation cycle. So this was part of the training for staff there. And uh, this is an example of a concrete coping strategy. So this is, we created these coping cards. So it basically has coping choices like taking a walk, listening to music, taking space, which is kind of taking a break, deep breathing, fidgets, bouncing on a ball. So very basic things. But this is not, if you're used to treating neurotypical kids, these, these are not, a lot of these are not the strategies. Think of the, the go-to coping or, or strategy in most neurotypical mental health settings is talking. We're gonna talk about what happened, we're gonna process what happened, we're gonna talk, 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 talk. And that isn't really helpful for a lot of our kids, right? It's usually more, that may be helpful later, or it may not, but it's concrete coping strategies in the moment is what's most helpful, I think, as just a very basic go-to. So that's an example of that. We try to focus on enhancing communication. And so that's the end of that pathway. So I gave you that very quickly, um, but I believe if you don't have handouts, these slides will be available for you to look at um, through the website or through contact in DDI. Um, so that was our boil down. We took like, what do we think are the most essential elements of what we do and could be applied somewhere else? Um, finally, uh, this is I think the last thing, um, is that another way we've come at this is we wrote, we had a consensus group across these um, expert units and said, what are your, we did a whole consensus process on what are your top recommendations for treating these kids, okay? So again, this is a boil down, of what's most important? So, and we published this a couple years ago. Um, so here they are, and they're gonna look similar to, to the pathway in some way. So first of all, get information specific to that child. So that's like the tip sheet. Screen for the medical ideology of challenging behaviors, because you can't, you don't want to just assume it's behavioral. Assess for co-occurring psychiatric disorders and target your psychopharm to that. 
assess and support communication and, and occupational therapy needs, including all the environmental structure, perform behavioral assessments and take behavioral data. I mean, there being, that sounds like kind of a dud probably to people in the field, but that isn't done in most settings, right? Uh, because that's what not what the rest of the kids are being admitted for, but these kids are being admitted because of behavior, so then we better try to take data on that behavior or else how do we know what we're treating? Um, that's a real challenge for most systems. Um, create therapeutic spaces and appropriate activities, provide structured educational services, give drug care staff specific training to the population, um, and then a couple other items. So those were the consensus recommendations. There's a long article that can, or a longer article that can go into more detail. So in summary, um, I think kids with autism can develop serious behavioral disturbances, and that puts them at risk for a whole bunch of things. The biggest one I mentioned and didn't actually write it up there is, you know, bending in the wrong direction their developmental trajectory, and that's really I think the biggest problem, but not something we think about. You know, it's kind of a big picture. Thing. But I will actually talk about that with parents, like why do we need to address this? Why do we need to take the risk of starting this medication or the risk of doing this behavioral plan? Because this is why, you know, it's not just what's happening today, it's what's, what we're going to look like in five or ten years. Um, but it also puts them at risk for other potential problems like multiple medications, which is called polypharmacy, hospitalization, residential placement, um, you know, it, so it puts them at risk for a lot of things. Um, the work of a single discipline is usually not enough for these presentations. Sometimes it is, but rarely do, you know, I think many of you appreciate there is rarely the magic pill or even rarely the magic behavior plan. You usually need a multidisciplinary approach because these are multifactorial presentations typically, at least by the time they hit, you know, your more uh, restrictive settings. Um, finally, and because of that, then you need a multidisciplinary diagnostic and treatment approach, and you want to manage the acute symptoms, but also look for those key chronic factors that need to be addressed. And you can't address all of them. You know, the kid may have constipation, but if it's not really contributing to this picture, then that may not be a priority to, to target. Um, but some of the key factors, I think, that have emerged are sleep deprivation, psychiatric comorbidity, communication, inefficiencies, and environmental reinforcement. So a few resources. Um, so the uh, consensus, oh, I'm sorry, this is a different article. So my colleague um, published a assessment and treatment pathway for irritability, which means aggression, self-injury, tantrums, in autism in pediatrics. And so I think it's freely available online from that journal. So that's a very nice pathway that lays out a lot of what I discussed today. Um, there's an article we published about hospital treatment that does a similar thing. And then this is slightly off topic, but, but just to mention, uh, we just, I was involved in um, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, just published this parent medication guide for autism spectrum disorder. And this is um, published online, it's a 30 page PDF. And um, it does a nice job talking about medications, but the reason I bring it up here, so it's a really great resource, I think, for parents, clinicians, providers. Um, but what it does is it, it walks through what I tried to walk through today, which is basically it spends about 10 pages talking about everything you look at and address before medication, if you can. If there, and so I think that is a good resource for people. And then it goes into medication. So that's on um, ACAP.org and it's free, you can just download it, hand it out to parents. Um, just, these are all, won't do this for time, but just these are all the people to thank, who do all the work that I summarized um, and support me, um, including funders. Uh, so thank you very much, we have about five minutes for questions.